as the second week of June 1944 expired, World War II raged. The Allies had gained a foothold in France after D-Day, while the Germans attempted to regain control. They had been completely caught off guard ten days earlier by believing that the coming invasion of Europe would be at the port of Calais rather than Normandy. Meanwhile, the Pacific War was gaining traction as the enormous B-29 bombers based in China were now bombing the Japanese home island. Unfortunately, the U.S. Army Air Corps suddenly ran headlong into an unexpected and undiscovered enemy that was not Japanese. It would become known as the jet stream. These natural high altitude winds, which often blew more than 100 miles per hour, were in the stratosphere where the B-29s had been designed to drop their bombs. The result was Air Corps bombs landing far off target. At first B-29 crews were blamed for the errors. It was a much more palatable excuse than the truth, which was that the wind simply did it. On the home front, the war machine was on overdrive. 1944 would see 45 million 61,847 tons of iron ore produced. Yet that was still 7 million tons below the projected need. The lake freighters were busy indeed. If there was one other material that was critically needed, it was without question coal. This was an era when nearly everything from home heating to power plants ran on coal. Thus, as the 611-foot steamer John Hulst was loaded with coal at Toledo, Ohio in the second week of June 1944, hers was a critical wartime load. Her destination was the steel complex at Gary, Indiana. Launched on June 8, 1938 at the Great Lakes Engineering Works in River Rouge, Michigan, she was hull number 286. Considering that her sister vessel, the Ralph H. Watson, was launched on November 20th, 1937, these vessels were reportedly the first major vessels constructed at that yard in seven years. These freighters represented an end to the ravages of the Great Depression. Both boats had been ordered for the Pittsburgh Steamship Company and their offshoot, United States Steel. The U.S. economy was waking up, and many of the ore boats sidelined in the Depression now needed to be replaced. At precisely noon, the Hulst slid down the launching ways. The namesake of the vessel was the vice president for the company at the time of her launch. She passed Port Huron upbound on her maiden voyage on Saturday morning, May 21st, 1938. Running light upbound for Duluth. She passed the Sioux at 3.30 in the morning on the 22nd. 26 hours later, she arrived at Duluth. She loaded and departed Duluth at 5.10 in the morning on May 24th full of ore. It took her 34 hours to reach the Sioux and pass downbound. Her crossing at Lake Huron, however, was done in just 14 hours. Her round trip took just five and one-half days. She was just as speedy as the plans had called for. Her first destination was Kaniat where she not only discharged ore, but also disembarked a full load of VIPs that had been in her guest quarters. For the next baker's dozen months, the Hulst ran her normal trips with no urgency. Then came the German invasion of Poland and the outbreak of World War II. So it was that at midnight, when the second week of June 1944 expired and the third week began, 
The Hulst was cruising along, doing her part to win the war. She was running through the Straits of Mackinac with a load of coal. Hot and humid had been the day, but the night was now cool and the lake was calm as the steamer came abeam St. Helena Island. Yes, I know there are several ways to pronounce that, St. Helena and so on, but we're going to pronounce it St. Helena. Suddenly there was a flash of light that filled the pilot house and filled the night. Then the sound of dozens of claps of thunder all rolled into one as the entire vessel shook. Next the sound of huge plates of steel slamming down onto her deck. An explosion inside her cargo hold had blown several hatches into the air. There followed a brief fire in among the coal. But the crew was well trained in fire suppression and soon had the hoses on the flames and they were extinguished. One crewman, Ed Caro of Duluth, was badly burned in the incident. Daylight found the hull's spar deck littered with at least five dislodged hatch covers. And at least two were missing. Now these were 8 by 38 foot hatch covers, each weighing 5 and 1 half tons. They were made of steel plate, reinforced with two I-beams that ran the width of each hatch cover, plus 13 7 inch channels running fore and aft underneath each hatch cover. Additionally, each hatch cover was held down by swivel bolts spaced at 18 inch intervals all the way around each hatch combing. Yet the pressure of the explosion warped them loose from those bolts. Here we can see how the force of expanding gas can distort steel plate as if they were made of modeling clay. At least two of the hatches were blown overboard and today rest at the bottom of the Straits of Mackinac. One of the hatch covers was on its way over the side, but instead landed on the boat's fence. As you can see here, another landed on the hatch crane and disabled it. Looking toward the stern, it is clear that some of the hatches are still bolted down, yet others are displaced. This one is flipped over. Additionally, some of the hatch combings themselves were bent, like you can see here. So, what happened that night? Consider that the Hulst had taken on about 14,000 tons of coal, less than 48 hours earlier. Coal contains a high degree of methane gas that normally seeps out. Methane is odorless, colorless, and the only way to keep it from igniting is to simply assume it is always present. Lake freighters have hauled coal across the Great Lakes since as early as 1847. However, the boom in coal trafficking began in 1888. By World War II, coal was the primary fuel in much of industry. But most lake freighters of that era had used retractable, steel, leaf-style hatch covers. Those provided a natural vent for latent methane. The first single piece hatch covers came out in 1925, and their gasket seal allowed for no water seepage, but also no venting. It was said that the hull's explosion was caused by spontaneous combustion in the coal cargo, which has happened before. That was a great ignition source for methane gas. 
After doing their best to clean up their boat, the crew of the Hulst retreated to Mackinac City. Their temporary hatch covers were installed and their injured crewman was moved to the hospital. The vessel then proceeded to Gary, Indiana to unload her cargo. When that was finished, the Hulst sailed to the Great Lakes Engineering Works for repairs to her hatch covers, hatch combings, and a repair to her hatch crane. Thereafter, this story was completely overshadowed by war news and pretty much forgotten. For the rest of her career, the Hulst operated so routinely that other than a few minor scrapes, she was nearly overlooked. However, in 1980, the onset of the Rust Belt recession caused industry to collapse. The need for iron ore dwindled to a trickle. To add to that, U.S. Steel introduced two new thousand footers into their fleet. That spelled the end for nearly all of the company's straight deck ore boats of the Hulst's class. Scrap tows became commonplace in the 1980s. In 1983, U.S. Steel sold six vessels for scrapping. The Hulst was included in that group. Early in 1984, she was towed from Duluth to Thunder Bay, where she was scrapped by the Shearmet Recycling Company. The John Hulst was one of four hulls built on the same design. Her exact twin was the Ralph H. Watson. The other two were the Governor Miller and the William A. Irvin. They were nearly identical to the Hulst, except for an extra deck forward for guest quarters. Today, you can actually walk the decks of one of the Hulst's sisters. The William A. Irvin is moored at the Port of Duluth as a museum ship and open to the public. When you go aboard her, knock on one of her hatch covers with your knuckles and consider the force needed to distort it in the way shown in this video. <laughs>